you get started, Lori, whenever you're ready. I think we've got about 7.32. So, oh, we got another person joining us, Brandon, here. Good. I didn't send you any bios or anything uh, because, you know, we know who Kathleen and Dan are. We, uh, we see them all the time, so. So I think we can just call, call it to order and kick it off. Thank you everyone for joining us. Water's such an important subject. It's such a controversial subject. Um, you know, it's been, it's been used as a great means of, of expansion and growth and, and a weapon against the same. So <laughs> it's a very complex subject. So uh, I'd like to just, uh, I'll just briefly introduce Kathleen Yurchak. She's the uh, Director of Operations and Water Utilities for the City of Pleasanton, and Dan Rep is the Deputy Director of Utility Services. And they're going to talk about um, some really important things, a 15% reduction uh, mandate, and then just what, what are things looking for next year, and what, what are we going to do to continue uh, saving water? So uh, thank you for joining us, and Look forward to hearing what you have to say, and, and uh, we'll go from there and close out with questions. So thank you. Sounds good. So good morning, everybody. I'm Kathleen Yerchak, and again, with me is Dan Rep. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll start the presentation for you. Okay, so um, as mentioned, uh, Dan and I will be presenting on our city council's recent action of declaration of our local drought emergency and our stage two water shortage and mandatory 15% reduction in water use compared to 2020. And so uh, our presentation today will cover the following and then we will definitely be available for any questions that you may have at the end. So. Um, Dan will start with a, an overview of our, of our water supply and then conservation efforts to date. I'll briefly touch on our water supply contingency plan and then again go over our city council action as of October uh, 5th for declaring a local drought emergency. And then uh, I'll review with you the stage two conservation measures. So uh, Dan will take it from here. Sure, so good morning everybody. Um, Thank you for having us. So I wanted to talk with you about three things. So I'll start with a little background, why we are here today. Um, and then I'll talk about water supply and in general, uh, noting, you know, Valerie Pryor's in the house and she's the general manager for zone seven. So if I make any major mi missteps, she can help me. Um, but we'll, we'll talk about water supply. Then we'll talk about Water, current water use and water conservation efforts in the city of Pleasanton. So just to give you an overview of where we are relative to that. So, so beginning with the background, I think probably everybody's well aware of the, you know, that we're, we've, we've experienced a couple of really, really dry years. And, and as a consequence of that, water supplies in the state and locally have diminished significantly. Um, one, of the, one of the major indicators we look at is Lake Oroville. That's largely the water, surface water supply for water that's imported into our region. So it's currently at 28% of its capacity. I'll show a slide in a little bit further on that talks about reservoir levels across the state. Um, and I think um, most folks know, you know, back in July, Governor Newsom, you know, uh, requested a voluntary reduction, you know, they had an emergency declaration, asked for a voluntary reduction of 15% in water use from all citizens in, in, uh, in the state. You know, shortly thereafter, uh, Zone 7 and the retailers in the regions, City Pleasanton being one of them, called for the same 15% voluntary reduction in conservation and water use. Um, following that, um, uh, in September, noting that things had been, you know, the water situation had continued to, to uh, decline and get worse, uh, Zone 7 declared a state of drought emergency and a stage two water shortage. Um, and, and then moving on after that, shortly thereafter, City of 
the city, the city council for Pleasanton declared a local drought emergency and a stage two uh, water shortage with a 15% mandatory reduction uh, water use compared to 2020. Um, before I continue, I wanted to just touch on the relationships for the for 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 example. So Zone Seven is the regional water supplier. So they're supplying water, bringing importing water into the region, supplying it to the retailers, which City of Pleasanton is one of them. Um, and then, so Zone Seven declares drought emergencies and water shortages. The retailers declare. Uh, also water shortages, but then they're the ones that institute the mandatory reduc reductions for the uh, individual users. So hopefully that clears up there's how that relationship works. So that's, that's where we are today. And moving on to, to the water supply situation, I'll lead off with groundwater because groundwater for the city of Pleasanton, we, we have our own production wells and we produce about 20% of our water and we purchase about 80% uh, from zone seven. So again, because groundwater is a really, it's one of our major local sources. We have a lot of it um, stored or a lot of ability to store it underground. This slide shows the blue region is the area above the historic low level in the aquifer and it's considered the operational storage. And you can see from there that we're actually in pretty good shape. Um, zone seven is the one that tracks this and keeps this updated. And we're roughly about 90% of our total uh, storage volume in the groundwater supply. So at the moment, we're in good shape there, but this source will be relied on heavily as we move through the drought. So that, that's expected to change, but that's the, in essence, that's one of our major supplies. So next slide, please, Kathleen. So as I mentioned, um, you know, we look at Lake Oroville and that's the one circled in red. You know, the, the, the takeaway from this slide really is to look at the colors. So you see a gold color and a blue color. The blue is water, gold is the storage volume in the reservoirs or potential storage volume in the reservoirs. And you'll notice that there's a lot more gold than blue. So that's not what we're really looking for, but that's the situation and that's occurring across the state. The, the red line, oh, go ahead, one back one, just to get a little more. To, so the red line that's on the slide there is, is what you would expect to see at this date. So this is, this is a comparison for about this date. So the red line would show you where we would expect the reservoir to be now. And you can see how that relates to the blue area. And again, not, not brilliant in terms of its, uh, what it indicates. So, so go ahead, next slide, please, Kathleen. So I um, wanted to talk a little bit about water supply, where it comes from. I touched on the groundwater supply, um, but this, this, this is a slide that's prepared by Zone 7 um, that sort of runs through all the allocations of water that, that make up our water supply. So it's pretty complicated. So we'll, we'll start, start in the center. Um, and the center is essentially the total that we have available to us. And zone seven is calculated. We have about 55,000 acre feet of water from various sources available to us. And, and we have a demand projection of 43,500 acre feet. That's the bottom number there. So that's what we're expecting to see the demands. Um, so you'll notice that the, those, you have more supply than demand, that's a good thing. But the, the demand number, the 43,500 number is based on an, an assumption that we actually achieve a 15% conservation level. So we got to hit the target. Otherwise we might blow past the 55,500 acre feet. So what, what about the, the rest of the slide it indicates, so where's the water coming from? And so it's divided up in two sections. One on the, le on the right is storage um, and and zone seven has water stored in a variety of locations. And I've mentioned groundwater before, and you'll see that there's a bucket there for that. Um, you'll also see that there's storage from state water project carryover. This is water that hasn't been used uh, and is stored somewhere uh, in the system that zone seven can work through their partners to bring into the area. And then also one thing to note here is you'll see like Del Val there, 
and there's zero acre feet stored there. So there's no storage available in that system right now. Uh, and then, and then on the bottom is uh, it's these are the Symmetropic and Kalalo uh, bank water. So these are groundwater storage basins, and when there's excess water, water is stored in these, and these are like San Joaquin Valley and and Anyway, there, there are these mystical places where we put water and we can go get it and, and transport it into the various systems. And there's a lot of water uh, uh, retailers and, or excuse me, uh, wholesalers that use this system. But you can see that there's water stored there and, and for use by zone seven. So, so again, so we have water stored and then moving over to the left, we have water that's, that's imported from that's not stored, it's, it's actually coming in through, you know, different mechanisms, largely canals and so on. And you can see that we have state water project on the top at 4,000 acre feet. Uh, this is the contract water that, that zone seven has available to them. And, and it's important to note that, that, that this is a 5% out of the normal allocation. So we're only, they're, they're only expecting to get 5% of that. And they may actually go to zero depending on how things go in the future. Um, and moving around the, the thing, the next one is the dry, dry, dry year transfer program, some water coming in there. And frankly, I'm not clear what that is. And if you have a question, you can ask <laughs> Valerie around the clarification on that. But again, it's water that's, that's in the system that could be brought in. Um, and then also some other uh, state water project and other water transfers that, that Zone 7 has in their, um, um, in their portfolio. And then finally, uh, Lake Del Val, uh, this, there's, we're showing 700 acre feet there. That's from local runoff, projected runoff that could be captured and stored there. So that's the, that's the summary of the water supply. And then, um, as I mentioned before, City of Pleasanton gets by, uh, we produce about 20% of our water from our, from our groundwater wells through an allocation uh, from Zone 7. And then we purchase 80%. And zone seven runs pretty much on the same sort of formula. They have about 20% of their water available locally and 80% is coming from sources outside, largely from the state water project. So that 80, 80 20 rule is, is pretty, pretty good for, for our region, both for the city of Pleasanton and then, and then within zone seven in the region. So that's an overview of the, the water supply and what, what makes it up. Um, in our situation there. So we'll shift gears now and talk about uh, water use. And this, this isn't regionally, this is, this is specifically to Pleasanton and numbers that we generate at the city. Um, so this first graph wanted to just give you folks a sense of how, what, what, what water use looks like over, year, over, the, over the last several years. So starting back in 2010, we were, we were the city was using about 16,000 acre feet of water per year. And you see it ramps up to just over 18,000 around um, 2012, roughly. And then you'll see a sharp decline. And, and most of you, I think, would remember we were in a, we were in a drought in 2014, was then mm -hmm. officially declared. But you can see there's a big decline as we head into that drought. And then it bottoms out around 2015. Which again, that's where that's when things started to get wet again, and 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 then as we start to came, come out of that drought, you can start to see that water use is climbing, and the reason I wanted to show this graph is because it 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 gives you some sense that there is room for conservation, you know, because um, because we we know that that back in 2015 approximately we we were down below 12,000 acre feet of water, and so we there is some room for for conservation in the system. So I wanted to show that as a, just to give you as a sense of what we look at in terms of what, how can we, can we even get conservation? So we think the answer is yes, based on this. Next slide, please, Kathleen. And finally, I wanted to touch on um, consumption this year compared to last year. So when we talk about the water shortage um, requirements that we're facing, we're comparing, the state is requiring us to, to compare. Uh, and the red is water savings. Sorry, Dan, I were trying to read that screen. Oh, okay, uh, okay. I'll explain it to you as we get into it. Um, so 
the um, uh, so in the water concert, our requirements for water conservation is, is so we're going to compare water use this year to the same period last year. The state has required that we compare uh, to you know from one year from one year prior. Um, so so that's what this show this shows. So you're seeing on the on the bottom axis per month, uh, and these are these are the this is the water being used by the city, and so you have uh, the blue graph. Now the blue lines are for 2020 and the orange lines are for, two, are for this year. And so you can see how they're tracking. The red line is shows the percent, whether it's a reduction or increase um, or, or change, percent change, I guess you could just say that. And, and so we started our voluntary call for conservation roughly in June. Um, and so you're seeing, we saw about a 3% reduction across June about the same in July, August, we did a little bit better at 8%. And in September, we were back to 3% reduction. And then in October, we had a miracle happen, right? We had a big rainfall and everybody turned off the irrigation systems and boom, we, we're now better than what we should be for our call for um, conservation. But, but I think what's important to note here is that prior to that, we weren't doing real well. <laughs> We're running, running single digits. So hopefully we can, can continue that um, uh, conservation trend, you know, starting in October and, and into the next few months to, 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 to really drive that water usage down to help us, you know, have supply for the future. So there's a, there's a, a quick background of why we are here today. Um, talked a little bit about water supply, where it comes from and what, what are the relative amounts that we're expecting to see and then talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the city for water use and um, conservation. So I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over to Kathleen. Great, thanks Dan. So um, I'll move into um, a little bit more about our water supply contingency plan and then leading to council's actions. So if you do recall and you were a part of um, the meeting where Dan and our uh, utilities planning manager, uh, Dave uh, Brazone talked about our uh, urban water management plan. Um, a piece of that plan is our water supply contingency plan, which really describes our strategic plan in response uh, to water shortages and establishes a, a fundamental link between a zone seven water supply outlook um, criteria for assessing water shortages. And so based on zone seven's assessment of the current supply conditions, and then again, concerns for another uh, dry year, uh, potentially reducing our available supply, it was reasonable to conclude <clears throat> that the supply may not be adequate to meet normal uh, demand in the upcoming year. And so um, that was the information that was presented to our city council on October 5th. And at that, point um, council uh, concluded that it was uh, reasonable to uh, impose the 15% uh, mandatory reduction in water use compared to 2020, um, really to help improve the available water supply uh, for next year. And so along with that action, council also declared a local drought emergency. And the reason uh, for doing that is because of the critically reduced water supplies, um, the expected continued um, dry weather uh, over this winter and into next year. And then uh, this allows us more flexibility um, to protect our public health and our safety and welfare, and then also respond to, to changing situations. Um, quickly. And then also, if needed, it allows us to expedite the procurement for equipment and construction. Uh, with the declaration of the local emergency by uh, state law, uh, we have to return to council approximately every 60 days for them to consider the continuation of or the termination of the local drought emergency. So now we'll move into the um, stage two uh, required uh, measurements. And again, these are a part of the city's uh, water conservation measures. Uh, we have an ordinance that outlines um, all of the prohibitions. And so I'll go through these fairly quickly, but um, keep in mind that we've got six stages, uh, one through six, 
and each stage of the restrictions compound on each other. So what you'll see in the first uh, slide and a half is really stage one requirements. And then on slide two, there'll be italicized um, requirements that really fall under stage two. So I'll just go through these fairly quickly, but um, water should be used in a manner that does not result in runoff onto non-irrigated areas such as sidewalks or roadways. Uh, watering outdoors is prohibited during and within 48 hours of measurable rainfall. The use of potable water to wash driveways, sidewalks, or other hard surfaces um, is prohibited. Also, washing of vehicles um, is allowed, but only with the use of a hose equipped with a functioning shutoff nozzle, and then water cannot enter the storm drain system. Um, all decorative fountains and water features using potable water shall be recirculating and leaks or breaks um, need to be repaired within eight hours of discovery or notification. And then pools and spas shall remain covered when not in use to prevent evaporation and shall be equipped with uh, recirculating pumps. And then um, just the general reduction of other interior exterior uses of water to minimize water waste. And then next is uh, restaurants shall serve water to their customers only when specifically requested by the customer. And then operators of hotels and motels shall provide their guests the option of choosing not to launder towels and linens daily. And then um, watering of lawns and ornamental landscape between the hours of 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. the following day is allowed with the exception of drip irrigation, hand watering and shutoff nozzles equipped um, equipped with a shutoff nozzle, and then also special landscaping um, and while conducting irrigation checks. So those things uh, can be done outside of those uh, hours. Um, and then here you'll see the three italicized, which um, are specific to stage two, which is outdoor irrigation of lawn and ornamental landscaping is limited to one day per week, October through March, and then no more than three non-consecutive days, April through September. And then commercial power washing and use of water uh, for construction activities uh, shall utilize recycled water in a manner that does not result in runoff or water entry into the storm drain system. And then lastly, commercial customers uh, should post conservation messages on bathroom lavatory and mirrors. So those are our uh, <laughs> conservation measures that um, again are part of our um, municipal code. And these efforts uh, really are intended to help our um, water customers reduce their water usage. So another uh, big piece is how do we inform our community and our, and, our, and our water customers? So one of the things that we continue to do is collaborate with Zone 7 and the retailers. I think we've learned from the last drought and just how we um, kind of operate our uh, water system throughout the valley is that collaboration really is key. And so we continue to do that. Um, information is definitely posted on the city's website. We've done uh, various uh, social and print media campaigns to get the word out. Um, we have our utility bills. We've got about 22,000 utility customers. So we have information that is um, printed on the bill. Uh, you'll start seeing information printed on the outside of the envelopes of those bills. And then also uh, customers should start uh, receiving uh, postcards in the mail this week um, about information on the mandatory conservation and the drought emergency. Um, we are talking with our businesses, our service organizations, and we're also collaborating with the school district. And then in addition, um, we are continue to, continuing to promote our conservation programs. Um, we've got rebate programs that are available. Um, we have free low flow devices, and uh, we also have an irrigation controller assistance program where uh, staff will come out and assess uh, homeowners or businesses irrigation system and program it uh, so it's the most efficient it can be um, in its water use. And then lastly, um, the City of Pleasanton, along with the City of Livermore and the Dublin San Ramon Services District, is um, working on uh, developing a joint recycled, uh, a joint residential recycled water fill station. Uh, this would be a new location. If you recall, during the last drought, TSRSD uh, had opened up their wastewater treatment plant uh, for uh, residents to fill up. 
their containers with recycled water. Um, their treatment plan is under construction, and so it's not really a viable option uh, for the community um, this, this, uh, this go around. So we're working collaboratively to establish a new uh, fill station, and that should be available in, um, in 2022. So that uh, concludes our presentation. Uh, we do have quite a bit of information on our website. It's uh, pleasantonwaterconservation.com. It has all of the uh, conservation measures and um, um, also the rebate program and other uh, information that I think is really helpful to our uh, residents and our businesses. So again, that concludes and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you so much. Um, any questions uh, from the audience? Jim? Uh, uh, looks like Lori has a question, and Jill, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see you, Jill. Um, let's catch Lori first. Thank you. Quick question. Um, because the, the comparison is to um, 2020 water usage, I know several people, including myself, who basically didn't live in our home in Pleasanton in 2020, so our water use has gone to just about nothing. Um, how does that factor in when someone goes back to living in the home and their baseline has dropped so low because it was unoccupied for 18 months? So how is that factored into the 15% reduction? So what we do is if, if a resident, again, moves into a home that they you know, hadn't lived in before, uh, your situation, um, you contact our customer service staff and we actually set a, a baseline for you. Um, we look at comparison, so average um, uh, uh, home size uh, compared to other people within your zip code. And so we've got some calculations that we can do to help you set that baseline target. So you have something to, to work towards. So you call the, call the city or? Yeah, our customer service uh, line, it's 931-5500. And our customer service staff can, can assist you with that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Jill? Sure. Thanks so much, Kathleen and, and Dan. That was a great presentation. Um, just a quick question. Are you guys thinking about putting out any signs or banners? I remember during the last drought, that was really impactful. A lot of people will remember that, you know, very distinctly seeing signs everywhere that we're in a drought. Do you have any plans to do that again? We do. So we're taking kind of a metered approach during the winter months. It's, you know, it is harder to achieve that conservation uh, during the winter months. As you saw in that graph, you know, irrigation really is, you know, our biggest, you know, water use here. So if people do limit their irrigation, you know, during those winter months, they'll naturally see that um, conservation occur. Uh, but we're kind of saving the really robust uh, kind of campaign for next year if we're in a real kind of, you know, more dire situation. Uh, sometimes if we, you know, have posters and banners up, people stop seeing it over time. And when we really need them to conserve will be next springtime. So that is part of our marketing campaign. But uh, again, we're taking a metered approach to it. Mr. Ritter. Yeah, great job, Kathleen. Dan, thank you. Uh, question, what's the difference between mandatory and voluntary and suggestive? Um, are we doing fines again? Yeah, great question. So uh, right now, the city council has opted not to impose any excess use penalties or drought rates. So really where the uh, um, requirement comes in is that uh, we would follow up with friendly enforcement. Like our police department does friendly citations. <laughs> we do friendly enforcement. So if we see people irrigating outside of those hours or you know, wasting water uh, you know, down the drain, those type of things, we uh, reach out to them um, and contact them and kind of and take an educational approach. Um, and so again, right now, there aren't excess use penalties imposed or uh, drought rates at this time. Thank you. I have a question. Oh, Nancy here in the conference room has a question. Uh, my question is around uh, getting someone, uh, a plumber over to fix your leaks. 
Uh, we've been in our home for over 20 years, so now we're having leaks, and they all seem to happen uh, in the same, in the relatively same time, but not exactly the same. So locally, you can't get a plumber out uh, earlier than two weeks. Make an appointment uh, two weeks out. And uh, we tried several out here in the valley. So then you, you start just uh, you know, calling uh, anyone you can get. And so uh, we ended up having four different plumbers uh, come out uh, at different times. And you know, I don't know, we don't know these people. <laughs> you know, we don't know, I don't know plumbing, so I don't know what they're. So, I mean, what, what happens here when you can't get a plumber to come out and fix <coughs> Yeah, it, you know, it, you're right. It's been really difficult um, recently. I think the uh, industry is extremely busy right now, but what's important is A, that you know that you have a leak and B, you are making an effort to resolve it. And so again, you know, that's, that's all we can ask, you know, our residents and our businesses to do right now is to, to recognize that they have a leak and make an effort to, you know, finding it and then fixing it uh, without penalty at this point. I, I have a plumber I just use it, that I'll recommend to you. Um, any other questions from the audience? Uh, Valerie, do you have anything to add uh, on zone seven or? Um, I would I would just you know reiterate what Kathleen and Dan said. Um, they made a very good presentation discussing the situation, um, and you know we are trying to conserve water and preserve our groundwater um, for you know future dry years. Right now, you know, the prognosis is not necessarily good for 2022. So every bit of water we save now is water we have available for next year. And, and the other, you know, thing that I want to say is I, I know that a lot of people have made permanent, you know, conservation changes since the last drought. And for those people, you know, we thank you. Um, and we hope you share your water saving um, techniques with your friends and neighbors. Great. Thank you, Valerie. Um, I think Herb came back up like first and then Jill. Yeah, just a quick question. I know the city is the biggest water user and Clippy is one of it, one part of it. What other things is the city specifically doing? Are we just not watering the fields anymore or what's? So, um, uh, Herb, let me, let me correct you actually. So our biggest water users are our uh, residents. So it's our, it's our irrigation customer. So we may have the, you know, most, uh, uh, kind of condensed turf, if you will, but when you look at um, our water usage, um, single family uh, homes um, are the biggest um, water users, specifically outdoor irrigation. However, um, the city and the golf course are still required to meet the 15% conservation, and so they have to meet that same target. So really what the city has done, uh, you know, obviously October really helped us uh, by meeting that conservation target and exceeding it. Uh, but we just have to be more thoughtful on how we irrigate. We have priority use um, criteria that we have for our parks. So when you do look at the, the sports fields, that's kind of our highest priority. And then we have a lot of passive turf in our parks and those aren't as high a priority. And then you've got, you know, landscaped areas, uh, trees and, um, you know, shrubs. Um, so we've got a, pri a, pri a priority similar to, to the golf course as well. So the golf course has a watering uh, priority and their criteria is uh, greens, uh, take pri first priority, uh, tee boxes, fairways, and then roughs. So with our sophisticated irrigation systems, we can um, set those um, to, for priority, wa priority watering as we get into more um, extreme conservation also. Thank you, uh, Jill. Um, Valerie, I'd love to ask you a question and, and if this is inappropriate, just let me know. But a couple of months ago, I was watching a zone seven meeting and there was a member of the public um, that I don't even think lives in your zone uh, or your territory that was asking about, you know, how, how quickly or, you know, where the pumps were set for the groundwater. Um, and, and this individual didn't feel like there was a real uh, dearth of supply. And you mentioned something about the pumps not operating at 100% in order to control the PFAS plume, something along those lines. Can you give us some information about how our current situation with that uh, 
you know, that substance could impact our ability to extract our groundwater in a timely manner? Sure. Well, a few things. Um, for Zone 7, the groundwater that we pump is state water project that we've recharged the groundwater basin from. So um, as we go through multiple dry years and pump from the groundwater basin, we know that in the future, we're going to need some wet years to refill the groundwater basin. Um, so with that, we wouldn't necessarily want to, you know, pump it all out in one year. So you know, absent PFAS, we would still want to maintain our pumping capacity for, you know, multiple dry years. And then um, as in the future, as we build out the Tri-Valley area, we do have in our well master plan additional wells, so we can pump more groundwater than we can today. So even though there's a lot of water stored in the groundwater basin, you know, we have 10 production wells and we can only um, pump so much. Um, in preparing for this year, um, first of all, the amount of groundwater we will pump this year for zone seven will be the most we've ever done. So we are um, doing it at a, a higher rate than before. And, you know, staff have felt that we could get 18,000 acre feet out, but 14,000 acre feet, which is what our target is, um, we feel more comfortable about containing the PFOS plume. So we do have PFOS. It is in... Um, let's say that we have like four distinct areas of wells, right? It's in two of them right now. Um, and we're able to manage through blending, um, but we don't, through this increased amount of pumping, we don't wanna necessarily draw the PFOS to the other two well fields where it's not there. And we don't know that that's going to happen, but we are monitoring it. So we're just being a bit conservative. Um, so really for us, the difference is between 14,000 and 18,000 acre feet, you know, some maximum like, pull out the entire, you know, 40,000 acre feet of demand, you know, that would require tens of millions of dollars worth of new wells. So that's not going to happen. Thank you. I, I, I understand. Thanks so much, Valerie. You're welcome. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you, Jill. Uh, any other questions? Um, I have another one. Uh, Nancy has another one. Uh, is the city recommending any kind of a container, a store, water storage container that can be hooked up to your downspouts? Something that you're, you know, if you don't have a large yard, but you want to save some of that water that when you have rain, does, does the city make any kind of a recommendation for something like that? Seven might. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll take I'll take this one. Um, so so no, we we don't have any recommendations for those kinds of devices. Um, you know that would be. You know, I think there's there's some pretty good uh, ideas um, out on, you know, out on the internet for that, and I think there's some actual commercial suppliers of those things. Uh, we we wouldn't we wouldn't be trying to re make recommendations in that. You know, the, I think the, the the important thing about that is you you know stormwater collection. You know, it's not a clean water source, so if you collect it and store it you know, you're, you're going to have to manage that some way because, you know, it's likely to, you know, start growing things, mosquitoes, among other things. And so it has to be covered and, and, you know, you don't want to keep it around very long. So you want to keep it you circulating and using it and so on. So, but we don't, we don't, that's not something that, that the city has tried to engage in, you know, because again, it's more of a private property thing. I know in other states, there are, there are, um, requirements for stormwater harvest and things like that, but we're not, you know, that's something that we don't have on our radar screen for now. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, thank you, Nancy. Uh, Bill Wheeler. Good morning, everybody. Dan, Kathleen, thank you for a great informative presentation. Um, I'm curious at the, to find out if the projections uh, for the water use is taken in consideration businesses that are going to be coming back online in 2022, like Workday or 10X in new building and construction. Or like our own company, we were eight people last year, most of the year. Now we're back up to 45 or 50. And obviously we're going to have an increase over last year. And, and how are those going to be considered? But mostly are we taking into consideration new businesses, new buildings, homes, yeah. and such? Sure. So, so I'll, I'll take that one as well. So one of the things that we do, and this is a cooperative effort, Zone 7 actually leads the demand studies for the region. So that those demand studies are pretty detailed and comprehensive. So, so you know, things like pandemic perturbations, for example, I mean, 
certainly saw that in, in water use, but in terms of, in terms of demand projection, those aren't, those aren't the big drivers. So as, as we're looking at what, what can we expect for demands, you know, we're not, the demand projections themselves don't really build that into, because again, you want to be more on the conservative side so you don't come up short. So, so in the short term, you know, we're looking at demand projections and things from the past and then going forward, the most recent demand projection that was done last year, you know, it's, it's casting for you know, 40 years. And so, so yeah, so, so the answer to your question is, is yes, the demand or the, the supply projections and demand projections are not driven by, you know, these, these, these individual perturbations. And so as businesses come back online, the capacity still exists or is in, you know, the drought being the exception, but, you know, the infrastructure's design, you know, being designed to handle those future, uh, a common future growth, you know, and then also, you know, we're looking at, or in large zone seven is looking at the long-term water supplies to, to meet those, meet those demands. So, yeah, so we're, I think we got you covered. Thanks, Dan. Great question, Bill. Um, I, my question is, is uh, when uh, do we uh, know if and when, if, if we have uh, continue to have these atmospheric rivers coming in, um, are, are we going to get to a point where the drought has ended? And how do we determine that? And what kind of rainfall do we need to get to that level? Um, I'm just curious whether you've thought about that or where, where how that is done. So that's kind of a long-winded question. Uh, I will, I will tell you what I know. Um, first of all, um, because of the severity of this this drought, um, the combined state and federal systems are at all time historic lows, um, and the State Department of Water Resources have said has said that we would need 140 percent of average rainfall um, to get to Lake Oroville storage, average Lake Oroville storage. Um, so. You know, right now um, the state is, you know, planning for a dry 2022. Also, um, these atmospheric rivers are great. They're a good start. Um, I think one of the key things is that they are wetting the soil. So um, here we're going to go inside baseball, inside water. So, you know, last year around April, um, the snowpack um, for the state water project, you know, about 60% of average water content. Um, and then by May, about 700,000 acre feet of water just disappeared. Um, it, the soils were so dry and the atmosphere was so hot that um, that snowpack did not turn into runoff. So, you know, quite a significant amount of, you know, water just did not materialize. Um, so these atmospheric rivers um, are starting to wet the soil around Lake Oroville and the other reservoirs. So that is a good thing. Um, but it's really winter snowpack that, that drives um, a lot of the, the, the runoff that becomes water for us. And, um, you know, not to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, I remember 2011, um, it rained, um, it rained probably in October and November. And I remember it rained the first week of December. And the reason I know that is we have a big water conference, which is it was the first week of December and it's in San Diego and it always rains there. So everybody was very happy. And then it didn't rain. It didn't rain for the rest of December and it didn't rain in 2012 and that started that drought. Um, so rainfall in October, while it's good, it, it doesn't necessarily predict what will happen. Um, the other thing is that because the um, systems are in such a deficit and they need to be refilled, the state has been um, telling us what their priorities are for the 2022 water year. And priority number one is health and safety water. So that's 55 gallons per capita per day. Um, and so, you know, basically for our area, that would mean, you know, um, indoor residential use and, and business use. It would not be for outdoor irrigation. The number two priority is endangered species. So that would be the salmon, the sturgeon, the delta smelt, the various species that are either in the delta or require Sacramento River flows. Um, Number three is storage, and so that is storing water in Lake Oroville and the federal reservoirs to provide cold water flows for a migrating salmon. And number four, so we're number four on the list, is water supply contracts. So as the state comes out of a deficit, we're, we're not the first priority. Um, 
At this point in time, I think most of the water agencies are expecting that this state water project will start out with a 0% allocation. Um, so come January, um, you know, we would just be getting very limited flows from the state water project and be using groundwater. That's low demand for us, so that should be okay. Um, but the state monitors snowpack, rainfall, reservoir storage on a regular basis. And um, if things get better, um, they will change the allocation. Um, and then we'll work with the retailers in the community to see what that means for zone seven. Um, so for right now, though, a conservative approach in conservation um, will best position us for next year. Great, thank you, thank you. Jan, did you have a question? Or, uh... Yeah, Valerie, the uh, dam that uh, we're talking about raising the level uh, to hold more water, uh, is that in New Maloney's? The one up in Contra Costa County? Yeah, Valerie? no, no, that's that's the Los Vaqueros Reservoir. Los Vaqueros, Los Vaqueros, Los Vaqueros, yeah. Vaqueros. What's right, yeah. the status right. of that, please? Um, the project is going well. Um, it received uh, approval from the California Water Commission last month for its feasibility study, which means it's still on track to get a significant amount of Prop 1 funds. Um, they'll probably be in construction um, soon. The Transfer Bethany pipeline should be in operation in 2025, and the reservoir, um, the dam raised should be by 2030. Uh, so for us, that would be a storage project, but, you know, we plan to store 10,000 acre feet of water there. So, you know, obviously in a drought, that would have been very good to have. But yeah, that project is on schedule and going well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, I see Brad joined us a little late. Brad, uh, you always have good questions. Do you have any comments or questions for our speakers? You're uh, muted still, Brad. Sorry. Yeah. There I go. There you go. Um, yeah, I have a, a question. I apologize for being so late, but with us being in a water crisis in capital letters, why has the state from top to bottom, bureaucrats through legislation, through governors, moved so slowly over the years and not spent the money that voters have uh, allocated years ago? Why is the state at best being remiss in their responsibilities. <clears throat> Nobody will, wants to take that one up. Huh? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, maybe I should turn the hard questions over to Kathleen and Dan. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, well, the, first of all, you know, uh, the, easy, the, the easiest answer is all the easy projects to build were built years ago. Um, right. You know, so now it's the harder projects that are left to build. build. They're more expensive. Um, there's more of a, um, you know, an environmental, you know, review of these projects. But Prop One was passed seven years ago, um, 2014, going on, you know, eight years. So people say all this money, you know, the voters approved this. Why isn't there new storage? Um, but there, there are several projects that are, are working their way through, but they are, you know, complicated and take time to build. So the Los Vaqueros Reservoir expansion is one of those. So that one will, um, that's on schedule. And for our Tri-Valley area, the Sites Reservoir is still on schedule as well. So these projects do take quite a, a long time to build. They are very expensive. Um, and then they need to be built in a multi-benefit fashion, which also means that um, they have to benefit, you know, wildlife and, and environmental considerations. Valerie, the governor should hire you for the public relation comments. <laughs> I mean, really, uh, and with, and I'm not being critical of Zone Seven. I mean, you are a water distributor; uh, you don't create the water. But seven years to start uh, the sites reservoir, give me a break. We can spend the state; we can spend billions of dollars on social issues, but if we don't have water, we can't take care of anything. So somebody in, in Sac, a lot of people in Sacramento need to get the message that it's a crisis in capital letters and no water, you're not gonna wash down the streets for the homeless. So thank you, Valerie. I just hope that somehow we can get the message to everybody in Sacramento that they are, they're negligent at best. Brad, I'm so glad you joined us this morning. Thank you for those comments. 
<laughs> unopinionated as I am. <laughs> Brad, Brad woke up on the wrong side of the bed today. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anything else uh, for our speakers? Thank you so much once again, Dan and Kathleen. Appreciate it. Valerie, thank you for joining us and your insights. Really appreciate it. Um, I think we will uh, conclude our meeting. Um, any uh, closing comments, Lori, uh, Vice Chair of the 2025 Forum? No, just thank you everyone for joining us early on a Wednesday morning to, to listen to our presenters. We always appreciate when uh, folks from the city and other agencies can come and give us a firsthand look and give our guests a firsthand look at the issues affecting the whole city. So we do appreciate your time. We know you're busy. Um, it's a comp as I said earlier, it's a complicated issue, um, and so hopefully we can get some. Uh, um, in addition to the measures taken in the short term, hopefully we can get some long term movement on it as well. Thanks for joining us. Let, let me submit that water is not complicated. Politics is complicated. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thanks for the last word, Brad. Okay, uh, have a great day, everybody. And hopefully you can uh, join us tonight at our mixer with <laughs> a partnership with the Dublin Chamber at All Natural Stone. Um, so we'll see you hopefully at five o'clock tonight. Thank you and have a great rest of your day. Thank Go you. Go out and make it a great day, everyone. Bye, guys. Okay, we will.